I'm Silver Lake Los Feliz area. I am a uh, governing council and training faculty for maternal mental health now. I also sit on the board for 2020 Mom, uh, which is a national policy and advocacy group. And then I do some consulting for a newer nonprofit called Return to Zero, which focuses on um, uh, pregnancy, birth, and infant loss. Uh, prior to that, I was working primarily at AIDS Pro Project Los Angeles, now APLA Health and Wellness, and I worked there for oh gosh, maybe nine, ten years. It's been a it's been a while, so hard to remember. Um, but I ran one of the first uh, county programs there, embedding mental health services uh, in homeless services. So I primarily was seeing um, homeless HIV positive individuals uh, in various stages, doing both short term assistance and permanent housing grants and working with them and their mental health to get them primarily sober because the majority of the clients I was seeing were uh, engaged in uh, meth use and heroin use and getting getting them sober, getting them processing through all those traumas, getting them into housing and stable. Um, and uh, so that is one of the reasons why being homeless and, and, and pregnant is a, of interest to me. And that's a little bit about my background. So I think this came from, you know, at Maternal Mental Health Now, if you've gone through our Maternal Mental Health Now training, which of course Welcome Baby has mostly, um, we do a monthly consultation call. So it'll be, usually we do about 15 to 20 minutes of a didactic uh, portion and then we bring up cases that are particularly difficult and we want some help um, kind of processing through or getting some ideas on how to manage. You know, of course, it's not advice because everybody in their own clinics has a, a procedure and, and most likely has procedures on supervision and how that works. But it's kind of like a peer consultation. And um, I think many people were not able to make that that Thursday 9 a.m. time. It's usually the first Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. And um, so we're kind of doing this as a natural outpouring of that. So what I'd love to do is I am going to go through my slides and hopefully, you know, we'll do a little bit of like an overview. And then I'm going to get a little bit more into the clinical context. And then from there, um, you know, if we have some time at the end, uh, of course, I always have a ton of cases to talk about, but I would love if there are some really difficult cases that you would love just some some processing on. Uh, maybe you can sort of type in, you know, that you have a, a, a case uh, into the chat box, that you have a case, and um, maybe very broad strokes, of course, with no identifying information, um, and um, we'll kind of... At, towards the end, I'll, I'll take a look and then maybe we can chat a little bit about those cases. So I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. I'm going to make it, I'm going to keep it this sort of small window here. Um, you may in the background see some, some folders and whatnot. Um, and that's, I think, just the nature of these webinars. And uh, let's get going here. So I just wanted to chat a little bit, you know, here's sort of the objectives. We want to chat a little bit about homeless and pregnant barriers to care, um, kind of hoping that you're able to walk away with three specific techniques to use with homeless clients in a community health setting and have some ideas about solutions to working with challenging and pregnant and homeless clients. Um, I will also say I hope all of you have lots of coffee because I'm aware that even though it is two o'clock on our clocks, we are all sort of feeling that it's three o'clock and if you are anything like me, um, after lunch I get really sleepy and tired and hot and I, I'm hoping I will be engaging enough to, uh, to not put you to sleep, but I would encourage you, that's one of the cool things about webinars, right, that you get to drink as much coffee um, and make faces at the computer as you possibly can. Okay, so overview in Los Angeles, we know that there's been a big increase in homelessness uh, homelessness over the last sort of seven, eight years. And uh, I think a huge part of that was the, you know, not just the 2008 financial um, crisis, but there was a lot of stuff going on in um, the housing department that led to um, some findings that there was some misappropriation of fund, and then the county board of supervisor 
ended up shutting down a lot of the homeless programs and both Section 8 was paused and permanent housing grants were paused and short-term assistance grants were paused and it, it, it kind of created an unfortunate backlash. That's a little bit of my soapbox from being in it at the time. Um, but again, ec economy is primarily the reason why we talk about why there's been such an increase. We know that it's, it's pretty significant, 42% um, increase in homelessness and you know because of the way in which the economy is going as rent increases you know it's really tough on LA because half of LA is renters um, we know that there's about a need for um, more than 550,000 housing units and that's incredibly difficult on a number of reasons both because of um, nimbyism and red tape and a lot of different variety and I, I won't speak too much on the way in which our current uh, city administration is managing housing but I think it's it's important <clears throat> I've pulled up a couple of these um, forms that I want to show you because what I have found is that, oh gosh, I hoped I had had it right here. Here we go. So here's the homeless count demographic survey. And um, if you haven't seen this before, it's kind of worth taking a look at. I'm going to put some of these links. Oops, let me put these back to all so that you guys can sort of click on these and peruse this at your um leisure if you'd like to get into it a little bit more. But this is the demographic survey that they use in LA County to do the homeless count. So obviously we know we've got the spas, we kind of have the age, perceived race. Um, you know, this is sort of what happens when there's the, the great count. And one of the things that's really nice is that there is sort of a non-traditional gender conforming, um, these types of dynamics. And, you know, they, they focus on serious health condition, which, you know, later is so interesting because there's really nothing here that says anything about being pregnant. And I think that that's incredibly important because we don't have a really good sense in LA County of who is homeless and pregnant. And that is primarily because there is no field on the survey to kind of talk about whether or not there, um, anyone is, is homeless or, or pregnant. So later what ends up happening is that there's um, some focus on whether or not they have a disability. And while that might get um, checked, there's nothing um, specific about pregnancy. And so unfortunately, pregnant women are just not getting uh, counted. So let me bring up the other couple of slides because I think this is just important to our work when we are seeing more clients coming into our offices, um, depending on, on you know whether you're home visiting or not, but you're seeing more people who are homeless or in various stages of homelessness, but there's really no official count for them. So this is sort of the specific one for women. And I'll put this in here so you can peruse this a little bit more on your own if you haven't seen it before. So you can see it talks about household um, composition. We can see that these are women who are sheltered or unsheltered, you know, and how is that defined, whether they're in a shelter, whether they have a car, whether they're couch surfing. And, you know, we can see that there's a pretty significant number here, all persons, about over um, 15,000 women are, are currently homeless at this time. And when we look at um, the uh, age group here, you know, you can see the, the, the breakdown. And what's interesting, too, is that there's like really high number of veterans and and high numbers of transitional age youth and we know that those transitional age youth are sort of at the highest risk for um for pregnancy here so then when you get into family members that's great but there's where's the the form where would you check if someone was potentially pregnant there's no form here there's no counting here of women who are pregnant so again i just think that this is really interesting um, when you get into health and disability, we've got substance use, HIV, mental illness, developmental, physical disability, which is maybe where they're counting it, but no one's to say. Um, you know, on the on the form here on the right, you can see if there's 
you know, that there you can sort of make notes or, or check in with them. And I've sent numerous emails through that form kind of saying, hey, you know, do you guys count pregnancy through physical disability? And I haven't heard anything back. Maybe other people have more information than I do. But but again, this is a real issue when we're talking about how do you get funding for this population? And yet they're not even being counted. Um, even when some of these other uh, health and disability indicators are. We know that there's a tremendous amount of um, intimate partner violence, and um, that, again, is really important to count, but, but nothing on, on pregnancy. And then let me just bring up the last one, if I have it here, okay. Um, and again, when we go through, um, uh, families, right? So this is the families one. Again, you can see here's the adult children and families under 18, but there's nothing even further. So that doesn't let us know if these are, are women who are um, homeless and have newborns or infant children. And again, how can you really apply for funding when there's no data count about it? And I just think, again, when you get into the health and disability, we don't know if it's being counted in physical disability. There's nothing that pulls it out. And we know that even within the disability, that being pregnant is um, its own particular, has its own particular needs in a way that 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 would need to be counted in, in my view. So I like to kind of make sure that we have an understanding of, even though we know there's this increase in, in homelessness, we really don't have a sense of who is out there that's homeless and pregnant. We know that, um, you know, in 2010, there were some um, focus on the ways in which pregnancy, that's the other one that I had pulled up. So I'll, let's see, did I close that? No, here we go. Pregnancy and mental health of young homeless women. So if you remember on um, the, the transitional age youth, there was pretty high levels of transitional age youth. And I'm going to give you guys this article to take a look at if you're interested as well. And that there's much higher homeless rates amongst um, uh, women who are, are, there's much higher pregnancy rates amongst women who are homeless, right? So we've known this since, since it looks like the initial study was in 98. And again, this is, this is one that's from 2010. And that they have um, almost 70% had been pregnant by the end of the study when they looked at half of sexually active young women um, who were homeless. So this is this is kind of like saying, hey, we know that these women are out there, but unfortunately, again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that they are not getting counted in LA, unfortunately. One of the things that's so interesting about this particular study is that they found that a third met criteria for major depressive disorder, um, PTSD, drug abuse, and half met criteria for antisocial personality disorder, which I find really interesting and not something that we talk quite a bit about in clinics in general. And um, but I, you know, just something to note. Um, and and this is just a really great article that I'll let you guys um, read on your own. So all this to say, if anyone is on the uh, call here and has some some cloud or is interested in writing some grants, you know, it might be worth doing some studies. Did I keep? Yes. So another site that I, I find really interesting is How Housing Matters. If you don't know that site, this is it, just howhousingmatters.org. And they do a lot of education um, and um, sort of like ways in which um, you can talk about how life goals differ between men and women in supportive housing. There's just a lot of really good information here and data. But some of the things that they find, there's like really um, some overall general criteria, which is that primarily women who are homeless and pregnant smoke cigarettes, they have low birth rates, and that about 18% have um, preterm delivery. And again, when we looked at the survey um, from the LA Housing Department, we saw that you know really high numbers of those 10,000 um, or the 15,000 women who are currently homeless, you know, like a third of them had experienced IPV, and we just don't know what that impact would have on potential pregnancies or not. 
Okay, so let's move into a little bit of why, why homeless uh, fall out of service in general. And we know that there's three main reasons why people fall out of service. One, structural barriers. Where are things located? What's required to apply, right? So we know that if you have to have papers and papers and papers and papers to fill out in order to obtain services, it's gonna be a structural barrier. Um, particularly if someone's not feeling well, if they're not kind of able to get to um, to get there, you know, these are where we need smoothing mechanisms. And what I mean by that is transportation, ease of application, we need better outreach, multilingual services, and co-locating services. Again, this isn't stuff that we, we don't know, but the problem is that where's the funding for it, right? Because when I first started out working in homeless services, you know, taxi vouchers were a regular thing. It was really easy to get clients taxi vouchers and and at the very least, if not that, give them bus passes. And you know, nearly 10 years later when I was working in homeless services, I mean, it was nearly impossible to get a, a bus pass and taxi vouchers were not even an issue or, or available anymore. Um, so again, it's sort of like, where has that funding gone for some of those smoothing mechanisms? We don't have it on a regular basis. We know that capacity barriers uh, barriers are an issue, funding, right? So we need more expanding mechanisms. We need to find alternate ways to build build capacity and fund programs. Um, I bring up um, Miami-Dade because in Florida, there was a particular restaurant um, that was noticing that there was a lot of homeless in their area and they had um, they had a program that got vetted and had oversight, but they increased their restaurant and food tax and um, they uh, then funneled that funding into homeless services. And I think that that's like a really nice way to manage um, manage this. And, and usually, you know, there was an explanation like, hey, there's a little bit of a surcharge here and this is where your money is going because of that. This is how we get our neighbors off the street. Eligibility barriers are often an issue. Um, I, I know when we did this consult call last month uh, for Mature Mental Health Now, someone brought in a client who, you know, they had some nicer clothes. They'd been evicted a couple years ago, but they'd been living out of their car. They had a gym membership that they were able to maintain. So they were showering and putting on, you know, nice nicer or clean clothes and makeup and, and going to job interviews. And they went you know, but they were living out of their car and, and pregnant and um, the service provider had to literally make some calls on their behalf because when they went to go obtain services, the response is, well, you don't look homeless, so you can't, you don't have access to the service. And I think that this is a major problem as to why um, some of the, the homelessness has increased. You know, we're used to really thinking about homeless as being, you know, disability or Medi-Cal clients, but over the last 10 years, I think that there's been a wider variety of clients who are not necessarily eligible exactly for Medi-Cal or disability, but don't have any sort of resources either. Um, and and that, that they don't, they kind of fall in this gap, right? They can't take care of it on their own. They don't have enough finances or job stability to take care of it on their own. And yet they don't make so little that they qualify for all the sort of more traditional homeless services. So, um, you know, how would we do this? Well, we'd have to do engage in some changing mechanisms, right? So ultra requirements, not capacity, you know, and again, you have to think about like do certain programs. What about people with felony charges and permanent housing? A lot of programs don't allow people with felony charges and permanent housing. And then that becomes an even bigger issue and kind of perpetuates that um, some of the homelessness that we see. So I know I had showed you the, the way in which the homeless services um, department were counting people. And just to give you a little bit of background, LA uses something called the Vulnerability Index. And it was created by this guy in Boston um, called Jim O'Connell. He sort of had, did a lot of surveying in Boston um, from, from his agency, Healthcare for Homeless. And it prior prioritizes services for homelessness based, based on health fragility. And he really focused on who was dying on the streets. Um, and then there was this organization called Common Ground and they exported the model. And I'm gonna 
just give you guys this link right here. If you're interested, you can do a little bit more. NPR did a, a really interesting profile on how Common Ground sort of exported this model. But what I find so interesting, right, so here we know that it's based on health fragility, and I don't know, many of us would probably say, hey, when you're pregnant, you are vulnerable, you might be considered having some health fragility. However, what they found was the criteria of the vulnerability index was that you had to have more than three hospitalizations or ER visits in a year. So more than three emergency room visits in the previous three months. You had to be age 60 or older, have cirrhosis or end-stage renal disease, have a history of frostbite, immersion foot, or hypothermia, which of course in LA seems really um, rare because we know that we don't get down to the same temperatures as Boston, have HIV and AIDS, or have um, a tribe morbidity, so a co-occurring psychiatric substance abuse and chronic medical condition. So then think about it, right? So nowhere is pregnancy me mentioned specifically. So, you know, the housing department doesn't reflect that in their, their questions that are asked. And a lot of times there isn't necessarily going to be a woman who is newly pregnant. She may or may not know she's not engaging in, um, you know, a healthcare interactions. And a lot of times we know that for homeless women, particularly our young homeless women, um, substance use is, is a pretty regular dynamic. And, and then there's going to be an avoidance of the healthcare system, not just because of whatever sort of institutional trauma they might have, but also because acknowledging that there's that substance abuse might re mean that if they do know they're pregnant, that baby's going to get taken away. And that was one of the things that, um, that was um, talked about at um, in Housing Matters and, and in this article um, also that I brought up here, the, the 2010 study, that a lot of women who were pregnant didn't end up with their babies for some of these reasons when they did get involved in the healthcare system because they didn't have enough support and um, there wasn't enough people working with them uh, and substance abuse became the reason as to why uh, their children were separated. So here's what they say following the vulnerability index. This is what we're supposed to use, right? So we're going to engage the stakeholders. We're going to count them sleeping on the sleep from midnight to 6 a.m., teach stakeholders to administer the survey and take a photo if the homeless person will allow it, return to the same spot between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. for three days, store data, establish priority lists based on data, brief community on findings, and create a housing plan as a result. Well, again, what we can see is that, unfortunately, this is just an area in which women who are pregnant may fall through the cracks because they are not necessarily going to reach um, uh, this, uh, the vulnerability index. So, you know, when I think about who we have in the room, and of course, I, I know that we've muted all of you because there's quite a few of you. Normally, when we do this talk, I'm either in the room or um, we have, uh, you know, less than, than 42 people on the phone. But I think just I'll ask these questions to think about, like, would this work for you, right? Would it work for you to kind of do something a little bit different? Um, then you know do you have access to what we were talking about earlier which was engaging in a different way with some of these barriers right so what at your agency can you do if anything about these smoothing mechanisms expanding mechanisms or changing mechanisms because we know that these barriers are why people fall out of service but again, you know, when you're just a provider, when you're doing direct service and you're not an administration, it's much more difficult to engage in some of these, um, these change uh, dynamics. Okay, so I wanna say that there's a particular kind of client that can come in um, and, and is homeless and pregnant. And while this is sort of a rough overview and you may engage or see different types of client, I think that there's some things that um, can be more common. We know that homelessness creates trauma and often our homeless clients are, are high ACE clients. We know that they have difficulty in self-regulating, so they might be hostile and angry, particularly towards institutions. One, because they've either engaged in an institution at some point and had some sort of concern or there's just sort of a institutional bias, probably and usually for very good reason. Um, but then again, what ends up happening is that they're hostile and angry and resentful. 
we know that there's a lot of self-destructive behavior that can happen with homeless clients, which is drug use, relapse, missing OB appointments, and, and in addition, a lot of trafficking. You know, I know that there is, unfortunately, I was seeing a client at one point who was probably about five, about five um, months pregnant and was so concerned about being able to afford diapers that she started in, engaging in trafficking behavior and unfortunately contracted an STZ and STD as a result. But you know, the anxiety was so profound that that was sort of a, you know, what or her higher level functioning was not thinking at that point. And it seemed to her this was gonna be the easiest and best way to, to save enough money to caretake for her child. Um, and again, sort of like, okay, we know that these are self-destructive behaviors, but this is sort of, you know, when you are thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, food, shelter, clothing, take the priority and an OB appointment, although in general, so important for, for self-care just kind of falls off the list. We know that there is, again, because that high cortisol level, that sort of pre prefrontal uh, cortex uh, elevation that a lot of times our clients are feeling threatened that can even be at reception or agency you know a lot of times it's being called out into the reception because a client might be acting out um, or agitated we know that sometimes that this kind of dysregulation shows up more in the impulsivity right so maybe they're not hostile and angry but there's a lot of no-shows and keeping uh, difficulty keeping appointments there's a lot of unexpected visits like oh I thought my appointment was today no that was like last week and I called you three times, <laughs> but here you are. Um, you know, that that's that kind of unexpected visit that, that happens quite a bit. We know that there's a lot of somatic complaints that go on, but ignoring some of the severe pregnancy-related related concerns, that sort of dichotomy between not feeling good and verbalizing, not feeling good, um, stomach aches, headaches, you know, limb aches, different dynamics, but ignoring the pregnancy-related concerns. Obviously, shame, despair, and guilt is a big factor that goes on here. One, just about being homeless. Being homeless is an incredibly difficult and destructive dynamic, um, and there's so much shame and guilt around it, and yet, being pregnant on top of it really amps this up because, um, you know, for so many more uh, obvious and overt reasons. We know that when you have a client who has some history of trauma, um, even sort of a shade of trauma like uh, someone being condescending or rude or dismissive at an agency, right, or feeling really threatened in a dynamic, um, that, that, that sort of hyper arousal can get generalized. And again, this is where being at the agency or coming into the hospital or going to the OB can be very re-traumatizing and as can you, right? So, you know, if in, inadvertently your, maybe whatever that transference is that's going on between you and your client um, can be reminding of whatever the complexities are of being homeless. Because again, homelessness is not a simple one-dimensional dynamic. There's often so much trauma that involves uh, being homeless. So when we're talking about what kind of modalities that we might use, um, you know, here's sort of my perspective on really nice modalities to use with homeless and pregnant clients. We know that we need to have an attachment-based understanding, um, particularly around missed appointments, particularly around safety. And one of the ways to kind of think of that is that, um, you know, you are basically teaching your clients how to trust you. And just like a, a child in, you know, that sort of stage of like, is our is the rope between us strong and stretchy enough? Can I go away and come back? Can I go away and come back? You know, using that with your clients can be very useful. I kind of like to call this reparenting, right? We know that that is a, a term that we all use in, as therapists, but in this context, reparenting may be more like case management. 
Um, we know that trauma-informed care is so incredibly important with homeless clients in general, but particularly even more with tra trauma-informed care is important to homeless and pregnant clients. We know that skills building is incredibly important, that how-tos, how to find shelter, how to find food, how to find finance, and, and or how to engage in sort of financial management. And that so much of your job as a, a therapist working with, with um, homeless clients really becomes that case management skills building. And that can be so frustrating when, you know, you're looking to do more clinical work, but you're basically sitting down and helping someone engage that sort of more upstairs part of their brain on like, okay, I, you know, it's all well and good that you, um, and I'll use a, a case example of someone I had, the, you know, someone who had some money and was getting eyelash extensions instead of, you know, paying money towards their short term. Um, they had been able to get into a, a housing program and where the rent was something like $200. And instead of paying the rent towards that, you know, they were engaging in getting their eyelashes uh, extent their eyelash extension. So it's sort of like that. How do you engage in sort of saying, hey, you know, if you do that, you're not going to be able to have a, a home and and um, just doing it in a way that doesn't feel condescending or rude or ridiculing of something that, that the client finds incredibly important for themselves. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many on, on the line here are trained in EMDR. It's something that I use often with clients in general who are pregnant and have used with homeless um, pregnant clients. But what I tend to do, I have a pretty specific modality. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But using CBT in the first and second trimester, and part of that is because of the exposure to cortisol, right? So we know that when pregnant and um, really in the way that EMDR can be an exposure type of therapy in that it can bring up an immense amount of um, historic trauma. I don't want to flood my clients with cortisol in the first and second trimester because we know that um, that kind of anxiety and distress can, there has been shown to be a correlation between um, anxious mom and, um, and uh, colicky babies. And of course, a colleague said to me, like, they're homeless. Of course, they're anxious. Like, why would you even bother with waiting until the third trimester, but I do it anyway, just because it's my particular protocol that I don't do um, immersive EMDR in the first and second trimester. I do it after 36 weeks, I will do some processing. And in the third trimester, I do more resourcing. And I'll get into that in a, in a few minutes of, of more. Um, IPT, you know, interpersonal therapy, that's another thing that is shown to be really wonderful with um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. But I think what can be tricky about that is that so much of the focus in IPT is on role transitions. And while it's really wonderful to work on role transitions from not being a parent to being a parent, that can be really um, tricky in um, a homeless population where the, the hierarchy needs and the trauma is much more profound. So I find it a little bit um, of, of um, I find it a little bit of limiting. And I will tell you pretty early on when I had been trained in an IPT, I was very excited to use it with a pregnant client. And I give you my experience in that I sat down and tried to diagram an interpersonal conflict, which is a huge piece of, um, of uh, you know, IPT. And, and the conflict had been between a case manager and my homeless pregnant client. Client. And I was engaging in pretty traditional IPT. And my client just stopped me and said, look, lady, you're really nice and you're really white. And I really want you to know that this is not going to work for me. And it was just a really humorous moment where I had to kind of be like, yes, of course, I'm so sorry. Um, I get that this is maybe not your priority. Diagramming this interpersonal conflict is not going to be helpful to where you are right now. And I am normally so very attuned, you know, that statement of like, meet your clients where you are, meet your clients where they are, not where you are, right? But, but it was a moment, a real missed moment that I like to bring up because we are always, one, learning from our clients, and two, when we have this really wonderful modality that can be so useful in one context is so not useful in another context. Um, so there you go. You have a good example of me not doing such a great job as a therapist. Hopefully, uh, 
hopefully you have similar moments in your in your own career where you say oh that did not work and you're able to have that reparative moment with the client and move on to something that would be more effective um, okay so I'll get a little bit more specific here about what I mean by reparenting so reparenting means being flexible, allowing your clients to attach. It means being uh, having a supportive and non-punitive environment. But again, um, it doesn't mean treating ch clients like children, but conceptualizing that they need a safe place and a positive parental role in order to heal trauma and improve well-being. Um, so how, how do you do that? Well, there's these few steps here. You're just going to prepare first. First, you have to educate clinicians and agency as a whole about trauma. And one of the wonderful things that has happened, I think, particularly in the last 10, 10 years is that we've gotten so much more savvy about trauma informed care. We've gotten so much more savvy about adverse childhood experiences. And most of our clinical staff, if not all are well versed in, in how to navigate that, but it's expanding that to everyone from the security guard um, to whoever is the first point of contact to the interns to even you know the NOL the food pantry folk it's educating everyone about trauma and this is so important as we know because our own experiences if we've had our own um, um, traumatic experiences really play a role here. I know that for myself that as a, a teen, I was actually homeless for a good chunk of time, probably about two years. And my homeless experience was very different given where I was homeless. And quite frankly, because I had education at that point and was able to have a much different interaction with social services than someone else might have. And, you know, that trauma is something that I had to be aware of and not bring into my clients whose own individual experiences were going to be so very different than my own. Um, and of course, as clinicians, we kind of think, well, isn't this the norm? Doesn't everybody know this? But when you're working in a, in a clinic where, you know, your client has to see three different people before they get to you, well, those are three different interactions that we need to be more aware of. So educating the whole agency about trauma and so that they can have an understanding about how their bias may be interfering and creating these dynamics with, with clients is important. So feeding your client, um, and I don't mean that uh, virtually or, or not virtually, um, oh gosh, what's the opposite of virtual? See, this is when I, I do need my own coffee. Um, practical, physical, not physically feeding your clients, but what is it that they want and can you give it to them? Right? Are they someone who does need, um, you know, are there any things that you can do? I know for myself, I used to have um, a bowl of apples that I would keep in my office and it seemed like such a small gesture, but sometimes people came in and, you know, I just buy a big cheap bag. It's like a teacher, right? Who buys their own supplies for their office. Of course, if your agency can provide this, that's wonderful. But what is your version of that? So sometimes it is sort of like I would feed them physically, but sometimes it's more like, what do they want and can they get it to them. I'm sorry, I can't give you a taxi voucher. We just don't have those. But I know that there's a study down the hall and they're giving out $20 gift cards to Target if you participate in the study. Like, it, you know, it's, it's just little things like that, that of course seems so um, minor, but can make such a big difference. And sometimes it's something simple as they want to be seen in a way that they have some value. I remember at one point, um, I, a client that I had been working with, um, and I was transitioning uh, uh, after their, we were terminating, and they kind of were saying, you know, we had been focusing a lot on getting them sort of like more um, straightforward jobs, and they kind of said, you know, I really want to be able to go to college at one point. Do you think that that's something that I could do? And I just responded and said, absolutely. I think about your resiliency and your capacity. And I absolutely think that you going to college is a reasonable and attainable dream. And I wish I had known earlier and we could start working on some of those steps to prepare. But in our last few minutes here, you know, let's talk a little bit about what is more practical. And, and I don't know if that person went or did not decide to go on and pursue, but what they were really asking me in that moment is, am I of value? Do you see me as a person of value? Do you see me as someone who has a future? And am I more than just being homeless and, and, and pregnant? Am I more than that? 
And sometimes that kind of feeding is is equally as gratifying. I mean, of course, you know, real food always works and so does housing, but sometimes it can be something that simple. Um, responding with sensitivity, even when there is a tantrum, right? When you, if you're a parent yourself, you know that kids are prone to tantrums. Um, I, I think that we have all seen numerous memes about the sort of toddler, or three-year-old or four-year-old, you know, oh, I, I asked for the blue cup. No, I wanted the red cup and sort of having a meltdown. And all of us are toddlers, right? We know that. And there's, you know, tantrums happen all the time, particularly when you're engaging in an attachment type of dynamic with somebody, you're going to be tested. So how can you respond with that sensitivity, that sort of mirroring first when there's a tantrum? But just like a parent, right, you know you have to set firm boundaries. I know you really wanted to see me today, but I have a four o'clock meeting and I can't see you. And I'm so sorry that that's frustrating to you. And I understand that you get to be angry with me. Um, you came here today, you know, I am sorry you feel like I'm just all those other clinicians who didn't help you because you didn't show up at your appointment last Friday, but here's what I can do. I can't see you at four o'clock today, but do you think that we could do a phone call at five o'clock, right? What I have found is that clients often have phones or access to phones in a way that they didn't even 10 years ago. So something simple like that, what can you give, but you also still have to create that sort of stability in that boundary. And it can be incredibly taxing. We know that for ourselves, it's like when you've seen a full roster of clients and then you have your clients who are acting out because their needs are so great and they're testing you, it's incredibly exhausting. This work is incredibly exhausting. So we know that nurturing um, is, is also something that can be really useful. And the way that I do this is activity scheduling. Um, you know, even as homeless, it's sort of like, what is our plan for this week? What is the plan between now and the next time we see each other? You know, you're going to, okay, so you do have a shelter that you're staying at for now and you have to be up at, out at seven and what park are you going to and where, you know, what, what kinds of things can you do? Who can you meet up with? If you are avoiding substances, are there meetings that you can go to? How are you going to get to them? Those sort of like activity scheduling dynamics that are so common in CBT are incredibly useful in this nurturing dynamic. Ensuring safety, you know, what I mean by this is I think a lot of times there's an immense amount of um, uncertainty about being a woman and being homeless in general. And I have found that oftentimes my clients have been in situations that I do not understand how they have kind of like had the, the resilience and perseverance to get through. And I, that can come off in a really condescending way. So rather than kind of being like, oh my God, that's crazy. How did you survive that? It's more like, oh, I'm so glad you stayed so safe. And, um, you know, I, I, of course, I'm always concerned about you. And I'm so glad that you stayed so safe. That that's my kind of way of, of doing it in um, a non-condescending way. Consistency, we know that that's so important. So, you know, both in staff and, and in guidelines and in boundaries, I'm sorry, you know, our appointment was last week. Here's what I can offer you when you miss appointments. And that's all I can offer you. I'm not staying until 930 at night to see you. That's just not possible. Um, you know, I, of course, it depends on when your clinic and agency and what those boundaries are. Obviously, you follow those. But, you know, you're thinking about it that this is the long haul. And this is really hard, I think, for agencies to do when there isn't that sort of top-down trauma-informed care because we know that really high turnover can be so detrimental. But, again, if you're not supported by your clinic and your agency and, and, and they're not trauma-informed, your own consistency is incredibly difficult to maintain. When you're dysregulated because your agency is dysregulated, that gets Pass on to the clients too. Um, positive discipline, you know, engaging in these sort of consistent consequences and modeling good behavior after a mistake, right? So I gave you the example of sort of my flub. Here I am, so excited to try my new IPT out on my client and I got schooled. And just kind of saying, you know what, you know, I made a mistake here. This was a bad choice on my part. And how can I, I rectify that? Similarly, you know what, you're so right. I see that I wrote down on the card that our appointment was at three o'clock and it is, and I thought it was four 
o'clock and I am so sorry and I apologize and does this work for you and all those kinds of good behaviors just modeling that but also engaging in consistent consequences this is the third time that you've missed an appointment and I'm so sorry I have a wait list I can't see you in this way here's what I can do for you right you know I have another colleague who can see you at at this time and and you know we have to kind of be consistent in what our consequences are. Balance in your own life, which is so crucial when you're working with this population. I think just working in the perinatal population in general, it can be incredibly fraught, particularly when you have clients who, pardon me, who might be involved or have cases open with CPS or who are homeless or who are really dysregulated and substance using, you know, really making that time for yourself and, and engaging in that own balance. You hear probably every person you've ever heard lecture get, tells you this, but it is incredibly important. And um, I know for myself that one thing I do is that I try to meditate every day for 30 minutes. And it is so hard to find the time to do that. It's near to impossible, but I make it happen the best I can, even if I have to get up a little earlier, because without it, I just cannot function. I can't take on all the intensity that the clients kind of I'm having to hold for them. So whatever that balance is for you in your own life, really finding that is incredibly important. So I've talked about this a little bit. If you don't know what I mean by trauma informed, it's a way of presenting services that takes into the account um, takes into account the trauma of homelessness, and and there's kind of these four pieces of it, which is that you want to make sure that everyone has this trauma awareness, that the emphasis is on safety. What are the triggers for your clients? What are the clear roles? What are the boundaries where you know clients can't come in and ask reception like, hey, can you give me a, a, a a meal voucher, can you give me this, can you give me, it's like, well, I'm sorry, you know, I'm reception, I'm not able to do that, I'm going to link you with the case manager, the case manager can do that. And, and again, you know, I hear sometimes it can be difficult, because I'm kind of saying two things. On the one hand, how can you be flexible enough with your client that you're reparenting? On the other, how can you have these clear roles and boundaries? And it's not impossible, it's just like being a parent in general. But figuring out for your clients in particular, oh gosh, hey, you know what? Um, my client who's coming in at two today is somebody who I know has a history of victimization and she startles really easily. So, you know, when you see her, if you're just able to use a kind of lower con voice, that would be so wonderful, right? So if you have a treatment approach or a team approach, that, that's really nice and, and wonderful to be able to do. Um, but again, it's not always possible depending on how you're seeing clients and who you're seeing clients with and who's on your team. But you want to give the client the opportunity to rebuild control, and it's really a strengths-based approach. So again, I think we've talked a little bit about what this might look like with, with pregnant clients, but it's sort of like that resiliency piece and um, having all that, everyone on board in your agency being aware of um, what trauma-informed means. So again, you know, I mentioned the modalities, more skills building, it's kind of in that case management model, you know, support group versus individual sessions. And I, I think that this can be so tricky because I, I don't know, it sounds like there's such a wide variety and I'm familiar with some of the programs that everybody is coming from. But, you know, I think that sometimes there's this impulse to move towards support groups and, um, you know, why that might not work in individual sessions, uh, why that might not work in, in this population, why individual sessions might be so much more important is because every pregnancy is so different. I actually see this a lot in the loss community, which is that if you have someone who miscarried at six weeks versus someone who miscarried at 18 weeks versus someone who had medical termination at 24 weeks, versus someone who had a stillbirth or an infant loss, they're all going to be kind of in this modality where this weird dynamic happens where I've literally heard in support groups someone saying, well, my loss is, is worse than your loss because at least you didn't meet your baby. And someone else saying, well, my loss is worse than your loss because at least you got to meet your baby. Now, of course, that's not a very wonderful group without some sort of intervention. So of course, everyone, who was facilitating intervened, but I think that this kind of dynamic, um, when there's a when there's homeless and pregnant clients support group, I, I don't I think it can be really tricky 
to navigate unless it's more skills building type of groups because if it's a process group it's going to be everybody again homelessness is so different you might have people who have some resources who are living out of a car versus someone who's in a shelter versus someone who's just got a permanent housing and it's just too it's a lot of different shades so anyway uh, that's my sort of um, soapbox on that and I you know say that sometimes we know that the agency bottom line about efficiency is not always um, attenuated to individual needs and again I know welcome baby is a different kind of program but I'll say Kaiser is a really good example of this that Kaiser really likes to to put their um, clients in general and support groups rather than focusing on individual therapy and I think to the detriment of a lot of their clients and I've seen more clients who have been um, who have Medi-Cal moving into the Kaiser system and then they're not guess getting the care that they need, unfortunately. Okay, so part of what can be so tricky is that as clinicians, you know, we learn CBT, we learn IPT, you know, we have an understanding of what motivational and in interviewing is maybe we learned harm reduction model but you know basic skill building of course in our own life but do we have context at shelters at food banks are we versed in disability how are we taking on these roles particularly if we don't have robust case management programs working with homeless clients in general it's really important to have both a case manager and a therapist assigned to each each client and I just don't know again at your agency if that's a, a possibility but even if you do have that that um, kind of more triage approach at your agency you really do need to have your own sense as a therapist what you know when the case manager is not there or when you need to kind of step in to do these these kinds of types of things and sometimes you groups might be useful when it's things like how to open a bank account and balance a, a bank account you know, I'm always sort of surprised at some of the lack of skills that that clients have and and don't have. Where um, I I did run a, a money management group at one point, and the client there was clients in there who were homeless who were very savvy at doing these things, but yet didn't know how to even get online at um, who didn't even know very well who who their whatever schooling they had hadn't even taught them how to get online so we did a little bit of a skills exchange in a group which was nice um, but again you know when you're doing these kinds of dual roles and when you're engaging in these more skills building skills building dynamics there is a real risk of provider burnout okay so EMDR, um, why is EMDR useful in this population? I know it's so difficult for a therapist because it's in a, a pricey training and I'm always encouraging of agencies to really invest in their clinicians for this. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times the, the agency doesn't have the, the money to train to providers, particularly because you know we know burnout and turnover make it difficult to want to invest in, in your providers. Um, and again, it's that agency bottom line and efficiency um, versus individual needs. And when I talk about EMDR therapy, that's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. That is a particular um, type of modality that was started uh, with um, a a woman named Francine Shapiro and she uh, noticed her in herself that she had been thinking about um, a trauma in her own life and her eyes were moving back and forth and so she recognized that there was something about the trauma that created like a bilateral stimulation so she developed this whole program about bilateral stimulation which is meaning each side of the body gets stimulated. And it's sort of people refer to that um, finger wagging type of therapy. Um, and But what it really is, is that if you think about it in this way, when you get a cut, your body can heal itself. And when we think about trauma in our own, you know, mental health, it's a little bit like a wound, but it's a wound that has not been healed. And so the mechanism behind EMDR is thought to be very similar to REM sleep. We know that sometimes there's like, well, if you are feeling really awful or really terrible or, or you know, even if you're sort of, um, you know, aside from more clinical depression where too much sleep is a thing, but a good night's sleep can really help heal ourselves in a number of ways. And part of that is that we know we go into REM sleep. 
So in EMDR, the theory is that when you engage in bilateral stimulation, um, when somebody is awake, you are mimicking that REM sleep and sort of the boulder of whatever the trauma is or the issue is kind of rolls out of the way and then the brain can heal itself, that the, the memory pathway gets unstuck and you can heal yourself. So um, I, I'm, if you do know what EMDR is, I, I'm so sorry, we uh, um, just seen Malik had made a request that I, I explain it a little bit more. Um, most people have heard of CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, and EMDR therapy is just um, something that, that PSI, Postpartum Support International, um, endorses along with uh, interpersonal therapy, which is IPT, as two of the modalities along with CBT that are really useful for the perinatal population. So that's why I'm spending a little bit of time um, talking about it. Um, you know, there is, let's see, let's take the time here to just look up. I'll show you this and then you can read a little bit more um, about it on your own. I will click this link and you can talk a little, learn a little bit more about that. Okay, so uh, one component about um, EMDR is something called resourcing. And, um, you know, I was sort of gearing this towards people, towards clinicians who maybe had a little more, um, um, who were working uh, in direct service with clients, but one of the ways resourcing is think about this. I'm just going to have everyone kind of, as I'm talking, think about somebody in your life that you think of as incredibly strong, as maybe, you know, whatever strength means to you. Maybe it's, um, you know, like a, your grandma who, who, um, well, I'll just use my own example. My grandma who immigrated here, um, you know, when she was um, four years old and with only one family member and was crazily enough born in 1904 and was working because this is pre-child law labor law <laughs> time period she so she was working by the time she was 10 right so that that's someone who might be a little bit i might consider strong so that would be a resource in my life of someone who i could in some way borrow their strength and i'm giving very basic explanation here, but in resourcing, which is something that you do in EMDR with very slow um, hand movements to engage in very slow bilateral stimulation, you start to kind of help a client feel as though they have some of the characteristics that they have um, that they don't have. So I, I, I Again, I'm trying to give um, a little bit of an overview and I apologize if your eyes are glazing over at this point because it's not something that you're familiar with but um, or interested in. But thinking about it like this, whenever we want to kind of bolster ourselves, maybe we think about a superhero on television or a character uh, that we read in a book that we really like, or even um, you know someone who in the beauty industry maybe makes a lot of money, whatever it is, whatever those sort of role models that individually both ourselves and our clients, someone we look up to, we can borrow their strength, so to speak. And so when you resource, you are just trying to get a client to feel as though they are infused with sort of some of the characteristics that they're missing. Okay, I've spun out a little bit on that. Hopefully that answers some of your questions about what EMDR and um, resourcing are. And um, again, I talked a little bit about how with the perinatal population, I engage in cognitive behavioral therapy in the beginning. So, you know, again, in cognitive behavioral therapy, we've got 10 cognitive distortions, and those are so useful in, in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Using the cognitive distortions with people who have anxiety, for people who have depression, those 10 cognitive behavioral distortions are incredibly important. But when you're homeless, are cognitive distortions important? And that can be very tricky because, again, you know, when you have a client who is um, homeless, right? Catastrophizing is one of the ten, um, one of the ten uh, cognitive distortions. So I'm just gonna bring these up here: CBT, 
cognitive distortions PDF. And that should get me something here. Here we go. Uh, let's see if there's a list here. I was hoping there would be. Oh boy, I got suckered into a site. I was hoping it was going to be a lot easier than that. Here we go. Yes. Okay. I'm going to give you all this link as well. These are really useful if you don't know these. But for example, you know, all or nothing thinking, but let's jump down to catastrophizing. Where is catastrophizing here? Um, so magnification, right? This is also, um, oh, they don't have the whole thing. Okay, so we'll use all or nothing thinking. Right, so when you're working with a client who's like, you know what, I'm never going to get housed, I'm not going to, I'm just not eligible, you, you know, again, the impulse is like, how are you going to shift them out of this negative thinking? And you're, you could kind of say, if you have this list in front of you, what kind of distortion is this? You know, when you're working with anxious new moms, I'm a terrible mom, you know, you have these certain schemas that come up in the perinatal population, right? I'm no good, I'm, I'm a terrible mother, I can't do this. You know, these are all sort of the, the language of moms who have um, anxiety and depression, right? My baby is better off without me. Like all these kinds of narratives that we hear when someone's really in the thick of their perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. So using these cognitive distortions can be incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, this is, um, Again, you guys can peruse this list at some point. But, you know, and usually when I'm working with EMDR clients, uh, when I'm working with perinatal loss or birth trauma, you know, EMDR is really useful, but you have to go through the cognitive distortions first to kind of get a sense and help a client start to recognize their patterns of thinking that are contributing in some ways to the anxiety and depression, at least is contributing to the record on the record player or the way in which their rumination is happening over and over again. And when you teach these cognitive distortions, it can really break that cycle of the, that rumination. So again, CBT when I'm using EMDR, all these acronyms here, but when someone is homeless, you're not going to tell them that they are, you know, catastrophizing or magnifying something when the truth is their, their whole history has led them to this, this case in point in homelessness. So it's very tricky when I'm using EMDR with a homeless pregnant population. It's not, I, I might do it a little bit differently. Um, I might do a little bit more resourcing first before moving more into the trauma work, because I rarely have worked with someone who is homeless who doesn't have, again, both that high ACE score and some sort of victimization in their history. Okay, but honestly, what really works? You know, again, to keep these clients in care, you need to have those smoothing mechanisms, those expanding mechanisms, and those changing mechanisms. And if you remember, that was all the way back in the beginning here. Let's see, let's go back to those, which is you have to have transportation, ease of application, multi-link. So these are really the things that actually work for homeless pregnant clients, but there's a limit to how we're going to do that. Right, because we're often as as providers or direct service, we're not the ones who are kind of in charge of some of this. So it can make it really difficult for us. Um, and and how can we both co-locate case management and therapy when maybe our program doesn't doesn't allow for that? So um, we know again, just when we're looking at um, clients in general, when we're working with the homeless population that housing and case management have to kind of come first. But again, when we're working um, in Los Angeles, when we're not even counting the homeless population because there are no, we're using the vulnerability index, you know, we're kind of in a bind here. So again, I'm just putting this up here. Um, this might be interesting for you if you are interested in, in looking through this a little bit further. We know that there's, um, you know, again, homeless women with addictions, um, we know that housing and case management worked first. So again, you can, you can look at that. All right, let me pull this back up here so that I don't miss anything. And then, okay. So 
again, to get a little bit more clinical here, um, a lot of our clients are unable to articulate their core negative belief. All of us have, you know, underlying software, so to speak, just like the computers that we're using today. We all have the software that makes us run. And we have both positive and negative schemas, positive and negative beliefs about ourselves. And I have found that a lot of times clients are unable to articulate their, their core negative belief. It takes a little while for us to work around to them understanding, hey, that they think I am not capable or I am not worth anything. And so often that those schemas are, are kind of a big part and chunk of those adverse childhood experiences that they, they had early on. Um, and, and we all do, whether we have adverse childhood experiences or not, we all have these core negative beliefs. Sometimes it's something so silly as maybe there was a spelling test in second grade and you stand up and there's no, you um, aren't able to spell the word and people laugh and what gets encoded in those neurons, you know, that shame and guilt fires in that moment and, and it gets stuck. And we know that the neurons that, that um, fire together wire together, right? So under the age of 18 and obviously birth through five, it's such an integral part of creating these underlying schemas. And a lot of our clients don't necessarily have the language to be able to articulate it. They're also the numb to the language of, of trauma, right? So that a lot of times if a client comes in and they're expressing some sort of victimization, whether it's, um, you know, verbal victimization, you know, whether it's someone in our foster system who went in and out of foster homes or someone who, um, um, you know, was in an abusive home for a while and, and, you know, ran away at 14 or whatever it is, they're, they experience these really immense and in, intense dynamics, but they say it in such a matter-of-fact way that they're very numb to the language of trauma. Um, there's oftentimes uh, an avoidance of an uncomfortable schema, but of course this is what we all do, right? So we either kind of say, you know what, I um, I it's sort of when you see the, the clients who are, um, or just in general, when you see someone who is so narcissistic that you just know that what is really covering is that intense shame and self-doubt. And, and it's sort of like the real avoidance of who am I truly? I am maybe my insecurities, but I have to overcompensate for that. And a lot of times in this homeless population, we we see someone who might be sort of numb or very overtly traumatic, uh, traumatized, right, which can elicit a little bit more of our empathy. But when we get that irritable or that hostile or that angry client who seems so help rejecting, um, you know, that to me is usually a sign that they've got that avoidance of some sort of underlying schema. They so desperately want your help, but they think that they're so not functional that no one can help them. Clients are unable to articulate positive cognitions a lot of time, and that's where some of that more motivational interviewing, um, you can use motivational interviewing to get to those positive cognitions, um, you know, or just even that modeling or that role play. Here is where IPT is really useful, that interpersonal therapy where you can both not, you know, if you've seen me train a person, we've done the concentric circle of, of IPT. Um, that's just one piece of it. The other is um, oftentimes you are talking about how you talk between two people. So when someone comes in, I'm having a problem with my friend or, you know, I was sharing, um, you know, I was living, sometimes women find each other and I had a client who had been living in a sort of like a makeshift tent city with two other women and her and one other woman pregnant and they had a lot of interpersonal conflict. And so we were using that to kind of discuss, well, how might you say things to her? How might you talk about yourself? And that is that was the opportunity that I had to kind of really say, okay, well, what about shifting your mindset into thinking, you know, you're resilient, you tend to be more calm and level headed, like that was the way in for me to start to get her to be able to articulate the positive cognitions was in this role play that we were doing uh, in this interpersonal uh, interaction. So 
you know, may meet resistance when we are trying to shift an inner belief, right? Because if you are kind of saying to a client, hey, I know you can get clean, I know you can get off the street, and I know you can get a, a, a job, and the client is kind of engaging in all this real help rejecting, that again is where your own burnout can come up and, and um, you know, Sometimes then the message is so simple to the client, you just get it much more simple, which is, hey, know yourself and take care of yourself, right? That it becomes much more simple in your messaging when you're meeting that resistance. We know that creating a safe and consistent envi environment for clients to reattach <clears throat> is really the opportunity to permit growth. And again, you know, this takes time and it's so frustrating depending on if you have um, how many sessions you can have for clients. Like I know for Welcome Baby, you do have a lot more um, leeway. I think you see clients for at least for like a full year, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe even longer. But, um, you know, that's a good chunk of time that you can actually do something with um, and and how help clients uh, attach and, and grow here. Sorry, pardon me, I'm gonna take a sip of water and then we'll we'll move on here to um, a case presentation and, and then we'll leave some time if someone else has something to, to ask. So this was a client that I saw um, for a good chunk of time. She's 27 year old African American female. She had contracted HIV at birth. Um, um, you know, I saw this client probably, this is a, an amalgamation, but, but, you know, we have to think about probably about 10, 15 years ago, or gosh, even more than that, the sort of that standardized testing at, um, at labor was not, um, that, that testing at labor was not standardized. So now we know we have it's much easier to manage HIV uh, and and there's a lot less mother to baby transmission now. But this was someone who had been in support groups from a young age, um, back when there was a lot more money for children who had HIV and it was more of an issue. Um, but she watched a lot of her friends die, uh, her cohorts, both from her neighborhood. And then um, she lost a lot of her friends to HIV. She happened to be someone who had been positive before, um, even when uh, AZT had been, um, the primary modality and there wasn't as many of the heart uh, regimen which allowed people to have less uh, have less um, side effects and, and better health. So she was sort of felt like she was the last woman standing. Um, and she was homeless, she'd been couch surfing for the last seven months. Uh, she'd be primarily a big transition for her is because she had aged out of the children's system so she wasn't with the same caregivers which had really allowed her to have some stability. Um, and she was really feeling abandoned. She didn't have contact with, um, she didn't have a lot of contact with, um, if I'm remembering, I've, I know I've kind of, oh, okay, I've combined a couple of cases here, but she had a history of bipolar disorder and she often presented as manic, but she wouldn't take medication. And part of the reason why she wouldn't take medication was because she had so much trauma um, from watching her friends um, take AZT and get sick um, because again the side effects from those early days of, of managing um, HIV and AIDS were was pretty traumatic so for her she said forget it I am not going to take any medication and she'd been to a lot of different providers before she came to me because she had alternately been given both an HIV dementia diagnosis and um, and a bipolar diagnosis but quite frankly given the loss of friends how many of her friends she had um, shepherded through HIV and, and lost them and then you know the drugs and gangs she definitely qualified for PTSD. She had recently broken up with her boyfriend. She had had a long-term boyfriend. Um, she had a, a three-year-old who was in care with client's mother. And although, interestingly enough, this wasn't a CPS mandate, this was primarily just because her and uh, her mother didn't have enough room to have her. They didn't have a great relationship, but she recognized that her three-year-old was going to be um, in better hands with, with mom. And so they had made steps to have mom become a guardian as well. She happened to be 14 weeks pregnant and hadn't told her mom 
And um, again, that was another reason why she was like, you know what, I'm not going to take any medication. So she was looking for a short term um, assistance grant so that she could have a move in. She had a, a line on a job, um, but she wasn't given, she didn't qualify for subsidized housing. This is someone who didn't have money, but had just enough money. And it was a, a kind of a really complicated dynamic. So probably for the first, I would say, eight sessions, we were really working on this therapeutic frame because she could not come to her appointment time on time. She just was so used to this sort of like, you know, she was a hospital kid. When someone grows up in the hospital, there's a certain culture that they have. And a lot of it is this like really high empathy and this um, not, there wasn't a lot of like responsibility. And then the other piece of it was like, she simply couldn't get there. She simply had no way to get there, no taxi vouchers. She had to wait for the buses. If the buses were late, then she was going to be late. She would have had to leave. Um, I think she was couch surfing um, in West LA at the time. And so by the time she got to, to where I was in Koreatown, I mean, it took her a really long time. So it took a, a while until we could kind of figure out what's going to be a better appointment time for you. And can we go from there? Um, and over the course of our time period together, she was able to reconcile with her ex and then he was able to find an apartment for them and be the primary person. But she still was having manic episodes throughout the, the pregnancy, right? So, you know, some of the stuff that was coming up was, you know, was she a danger to herself? Was she a danger to her baby? And were there CPS reporting issues? And ultimately, not, not you know, there wasn't any CPS because obviously, you know, her three-year-old was in care with, with mom, who was a guardian. But again, and the mania wasn't, um, she didn't have bipolar one, it was definitively bipolar two. So there was a lot more hypomania and pressured speech, but so much so that other care providers were thinking that she um, was using at the time, but her lab said otherwise. So it's just one of those cases where I had the ability to triage with her. I had, um, you know, she signed releases for me to talk to her doctor. She signed releases for me to talk to two different prior providers. Like this is someone who really wanted help, who didn't want to be homeless. And really, quite frankly, she may not have gone back to the ex who was not abusive. She just was no longer in love with him. She'd been with him for a good um, um, five years and, and they had not planned on having a second child. It was an accidental pregnancy, right? So all these perinatal dynamics are in play. But I, you know, quite frankly, when she was not given the subsidized housing, I mean, that's really what I think made her reconcile with her ex. And, um, and I think that that was just something that I felt like so frustrated with that there were no programs at that time that would have been able to, to um, kind of really hold her in a way where she could have moved more towards independence on her own. But who knows if that would have, what that would have been. So it's just, it's a very complex case, both with my counter transference and then just in terms of like homeless, bipolar, real history of PTSD and loss. And this is someone that we did um, some EMDR with once she got a little bit more stable. We did EMDR towards the end of the pregnancy and a lot of it was like around, um, she had birth trauma from her first and then there was a real fear and anxiety which was really fueling some of the, the manic energy aside from the manic episode, hypomanic episode, but around I'm gonna lose this baby. And so much of that came from her PTSD. Okay, so if I'm not mistaken, we're just about at um, our time here, and um, I, I will give, um, okay, so we've got a question here. Do you have strategies around engaging clients into services? Our challenges have been getting in clients into home visitation services. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, how can you engage clients? I mean, this is sort of a bigger agency question, right? Because we know that these barriers are why homeless fall out of service. So if you're asking like, what can we do? It's like, well, what kind of smoothing mechanisms can you provide? And if your agency is not able to provide these, how can you lobby them to get them to provide this, right? Because if they're, you know, if someone is looking for home visitation, but they're homeless, I mean, that's kind of an oxymoron. You probably have to rebrand what you're calling it, right? So maybe it's like uh, additional care support and you're coming out with something like a care package. And it's like, you know, whether it's, 
pads or soap or shampoo or, you know, socks or all the things that we know that homeless clients really like and need, you know, that may be, hey, sign up for this program and we'll come out to you if you're pregnant. Because obviously, if you're labeling something home visitation and they're like, we don't have a home, we're living under the 101, that that's maybe where it gets a little bit more difficulty. So it's really then how do you kind of get a smoothing mechanism that meets the need of who you are trying to reach? Um, again, I think another part of this is that there needs to be more policy work on how to have the housing department really count these pregnant clients and where they are. Because I'm, I have no doubt that they're out there, but they're again, they're not getting charted in the proper way. So you don't know where to go um, to kind of reach them. I, I don't know if that's really truly going to answer, <laughs> you know, if it's the golden key to unlocking. But again, you know, can you think about, can you rebrand it so that you're not saying home visitation? Because again, if someone who's homeless, if you remember the example of, of my client kind of, here I am trying to do this wonderful intervention and the client being like, look, lady, you know, you're missing the mark here. It's sort of like I had to take a step back and think, okay, where am I going to meet this client? Where are they? And how can I sort of like shift my thinking and what are their actual needs? And if their needs are, you know that they need this, this emotional support, you know that they need this, these care providing dynamics, but the, they're like, I just need a home before someone can come do home visitation. Is it both rebranding and then what kinds of smoothing mechanism can you do? Can you, is it something that you can provide if you can't provide transportation, if you can't provide, you know, ease of application? Um, can you do something that's the equivalent if you were on when I was talking about the bowl of apples that I would regularly have or oranges or something like that? I always had a big bowl of fruit that I would do. What's your version of that? I hope that at least answered something for you. Uh, any other questions that someone might might have that I can answer here? Thanks, Elise. Um, if anyone has questions, they should put them into the chat box. Okay. Okay. So Jessica is telling us, and this was something that we had talked about, um, MCH Access has shared that Lessa is now categorizing a pregnant woman as family for herself and her unborn baby, and they can go through the coordinated entry system to apply to apply for housing support. So I'm going to take the time here, actually, and go back to that slide because that will be really helpful for all of us to look at here. So you're talking that they're not putting it under female, that they're saying that they're looking as it as family. And I definitely have some questions. I, first of all, I so appreciate that you're giving us that feedback, Jessica. Um, but let's take a look here. Okay. So they're saying that if they have in the family unit, right, so that a pregnant woman, they're categorizing her as family for herself and her unborn baby. Yeah, uh, okay. I just don't see, I think my confusion is where they have um, put this in, right? So, because when we see young family members, they don't say, um, interesting, you're saying that's an older document. I, I just pulled this off. It's 20, it's the 2018 continuum of care. So unless there's, a, okay, so this is a fairly recent change. Well, that's great news. And um, maybe they just have not yet published it because this is the one that's uh, accessible online when you go to the LASA link. So we will stay tuned and hopefully there's something more that breaks it down um, and perhaps, you know, um, uh, M MCH Access can, can forward that around and we can kind of see, or maybe they can publish it online and when we follow that link, it will come up um, for 2018. But again, um, that would, I'd really appreciate Jessica, if you can, if you're following us along in the chat box, you can see that she's following up with, with more information. But again, even then, you know, kind of categorizing it as family, you have to think about like, is, is, um, you know, when they're doing the count, is that going to be something um, that everyone gets trained on? Hopefully that they're able to articulate that because it's, they're not going to necessarily have 
or maybe they will have their own field, but yet again, we will perhaps get an opportunity they can enter into the system to apply for housing support um, if they're eligible. So hopefully it'll give us a little bit more numbers um, and hopefully they'll be able to break down how many are pregnant um, where it doesn't just say under 18, where it will say pregnant and we'll get a better sense of what the, the need is here. Okay, so any other questions that I might be able to answer? The chat box is still open. We have two more minutes. Anyone two has questions? more minutes. <laughs> I think there was some really great information here, um, and hopefully everyone was able to take something away that they'll be able to help their clients with. And um, I will be sending the materials and I will try to include all of the links that were in this chat box that at least so helpfully. Yeah, um, and you know what I'll do? I will send a PDF of this. And if you wanna send that around, people can see, you know, again, to me, this was really designed to be more of like a, a clinical um, um, discussion of engaging. So, you know, I don't know how many were clinicians on the phone versus case managers, but again, just to kind of do an overview um, and be able to move a little bit more into, you know, what are the challenges that we face and like whether or not you're a therapist, that some of these things you can do. And even if you're an agency and you are wanting to move more quickly into being able to support this population, um, but that these are some of these things like having, you know, attachment based understanding, doing the reparenting, having trauma informed care, figuring out how to kind of engage in some skills building um, and having your, your providers engage in some skill building, you know, it's going to look a little bit different than the traditional perinatal mental health because if you think about the hierarchy of needs, the homelessness is really the, the main, um, the first point that, that has to be focused on before you can then kind of do a more traditional perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, uh, you know, uh, therapy. All right. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, she'll, so you'll send me the PDF yeah, yeah, and will. I will send all of this information. It's been great having you. Um, Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. And, and I know I, obviously there were some 40 plus of you on the phone and it's always so bizarre to do these webinars where I don't get to see you. But thank you so much for, um, for joining and listening. And of course, I had put my email up here and you're always welcome to email me if there was anything that you think of that you hadn't had an opportunity. Um, and I would encourage you if you can to make those 9 a.m. maternal mental health now. Um, case consultation calls, that's always another wonderful place. I know in December we're going to be talk talking about um, marijuana use in pregnant clients um, and so we'll be focusing on on cases in which pregnant clients and postpartum clients are using marijuana. That sounds fascinating. We, um, thank you for letting us know. You're welcome. All right so um, with that um, we're a minute over. Um, thank you all for your attention and your questions. Um, we will, we have our next peer call in February and I will send out information closer to the date. Thanks again, Elise, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.